the museum by John Humber. It was already on display when we opened um, in downtown Raleigh in 56. It used to be in the collection of JP Morgan. And at some point, um, the head had been removed from the torso, from the body, because they were from different statue next. Now, one of the discoveries that we made during the research, because we don't just research and look at the statue, we look at paperwork, we look at archives, we look at publications. Uh, we did discover that there was a previous owner before JP Morgan, uh, and that was the Palazzo Altemps in Rome. And that was very exciting uh, because we actually could recognize our statue in the drawing that you see uh, on the screen with the raised arm. Uh, next, please. Uh, also digging through the files, what we discovered uh, was correspondence between the director of the museum back in, in the 1960s, Eustace Beer, and classical scholars who had been asked to look at Bacchus. Uh, we discovered that there was a discussion about the torso in the embedded in Bacchus. There were others similar to it, Naples, Rome, and Florence. And uh, next please. And our consultant found another one. So you have five torsos embedded in statues, except for the ones in Florence, um, that are very similar. And that's only five in the whole world. So we did have a very rare uh, torso. Next, thank you. Um, and what we have is also uh, something that uh, Professor Langlotz mentioned um, that he thought the, sca the sculpture was a horror of an antiquity and he suggested that we take it um, apart. Next slide. Unfortunately, uh, the director of the museum said, hey, we're a brand new museum. We don't have a conservation lab. We don't have a curator of ancient art. Uh, I don't think we can take the statue apart to free that ancient torso and display it by itself. We'll leave that to a future generation. Next slide. And that did not happen until 1983 when we moved to the location on Blue Ridge Road. And you can see the head was removed from uh, the sculpture and then the berries and the leaves were removed as well. The nose, which is not ancient, uh, was a plaster uh, reconstruction was removed, but then we decided to put another one back on so that Bacchus looked a little bit um, better. But as you can see, nothing happened to the torso. It was never removed from the rest of the statue. Next. So when we devised the project, uh, it was to complete that de-restoration, <clears throat> excuse me, that had been started in the 80s. The torso would be displayed by itself, the head would be displayed by it itself. But what we wanted to do is reuse those historical non-ancient limbs and recreate Bacchus based on that image that we had found of the statue uh, at the Palazzo Altams. Next. That was the original plan. And now I'm gonna let uh, Corey tell you about said plan. And the plan was really to research the statue um, from all its angles with different methods, science, technology, everything. Um, and that's what we'll be talking about um, today. So Corey, it's now your turn. I have unmuted myself. Hello everyone, I am Corey Riley. I'm the art conser uh, objects conservator at the North Carolina Museum of Art. Um, when I say I'm an objects conservator, that means I'm in charge of all the things that are three dimensional. So on the pictures you see um, marble sculptures, ceramics, glass, that sort of thing. Um, I started at the NCMA about three years ago and on the very first day walking in, Bacchus was waiting for me uh, in the conservation lab. So it has been a long, wonderful time with him in the lab. All right, so Bacchus is a composite sculpture. So as Caroline was telling you, the torso is embedded in a lot of other pieces. Um, and to try to understand what we had to do for conservation, you really understand why these things exist. Um, the composite sculptures are really quite common. And once I tell you about them, you're gonna be able to identify them in a lot of museums around. When you think you're looking at a full sculpture, if you see all the joins between these pieces, you realize it's probably put together from a lot of different things. So Bacchus's body had seven major fragments and then there was the head and then what we fondly call the bits and bobs which are all the leaves and the fairies and these sorts of things. 
So composite sculptures um, were made from ancient pieces. Um, and the reason why they were made, if you think about Italy in the Renaissance or the 18th century, um, the land mass that Rome takes up was much smaller than ancient Rome. So if you're a farmer and you're out in your field and you're plowing and you come up with an arm or a leg, you have these bits of, of sculptures that you can't really sell because at the time you only wanted to have a big complete sculpture. Um, we didn't really value parts in, of sculptures until the Belvedere torso, which was a lot longer later away. But what, what would you do with all of these things? So we have evidence um, of sculptors in um, Italy who would take the different pieces of ancient sculptures and put them together. And when they were complete, they could sell it as a whole. A lot more money um, and a lot more uh, prestige to sell these. Um, it's interesting to, to go into all the research and you realize that uh, sculptors such as Bernini were, were doing this. This is really a common practice. Um, and I love this image here. Um, it's from the Elementary Instructions for Students of Sculpture in 1802. Um, and what I love about it is the gantries. And when we get to the end of our talk and we're talking about Bacchus and putting them back together, the gantry technology has not changed all that much from the time that this was published. So you think about all these things going back together and, and you have to realize how they're put together. Um, NCMA has a wonderful x-ray unit, um, but x-rays are not strong enough to get through marble sculpture. So we had to have a gamma ray um, company come in called ba Baker Testing. Uh, they usually work with construction sites trying to do find metal pieces inside cement walls or in tubes or tunnels or this sort of thing. This was the first time that they had ever experienced working with an artwork. Um, and because they were bringing in a radioactive source, we had to hide in the basement in the boiler room because it was the only place that we wouldn't be hurting anybody else. We put signs up all over saying radioactive source and, and research being done. We had to do it on a Monday when the museum was closed. And what we found was that every single join we had identified was filled with metal pieces. And so what you're seeing here are um, the marble stone and the metal components that are in there. So we're going to take a little closer look at the left arm right now so you can see what we're looking at. Here we have the left arm in a picture and the left arm of the gamma ray. Um, and so when you're looking at these and you're examining them, first you see that there's a, a join between the marble fragments. Um, this area looks more um, radio transparent because it's plaster in there actually. So when they formed the, the pieces to put together, they didn't do it quite as perfectly as they did for the head. Um, so there was a lot of extra space and they filled it with plaster. You also have a very large metal staple. Um, we're not able to tell what type of metal it is when you're looking at the gamma rays. That was for later um, investigation, but we knew that there was a very big staple in this area holding the arm onto the shoulder. The staple was uh, attached to giant rods that ran into the body of Bacchus and it was attached with screws. And this is where it gets very interesting because Caroline was telling you about the plots all temps and we had an etching of Bacchus at the time that was 1836. But screws um, and the ability to do um, threaded rods didn't become popular um, until the end of the 19th century. So this very post dates when we know that, that Bacchus was um, in his form as Bacchus with his grapes above his head. So we need to figure out when this all happened, you know? So, so we needed to get a little bit further in. Oh, here's another threaded rod. Um, it's about an eight inch threaded rod. Um, and so obviously it was done after you could make um, machines do thread around because otherwise it would be excess threading. And so those two areas I was showing you before was on the outside of the arm and the outside of the hip. And when you looked at the um, sculpture itself, there were these marble patches um, in these areas conveniently. So I could take them off um, and try to investigate what was underneath there. I was really trying to get to these um, threaded rods to see if we could identify when they were put in there. So when we took off the marble patches, there was plaster behind and we excavated down to these areas. You see the flat headed screw on the left, which is um, from behind the arm. And on the right is this threaded rod that just kept fascinating me, um, which is in the uh, left hip. Um, it's going through a brass plate that connected the stump on the side to the leg itself. Um, and when we took measurements of it, it was clear that it was machine made. It was also um, metric in measurement. So did this conservation treatment happen over in Europe? We think probably so. Can't say definitely um, because you were able to buy metric um, threads and rods in America. It was just not as common. So while these were exposed, 
we decided to have Jennifer Mass come down. Jennifer Mass is a material scientist from New York City. Um, she works for scientific analysis of fine arts. And she came down to study all of the restoration material. So she was studying the patina on the stone, the metal pieces, the restoration um, adhesive in the joints. And she was able to identify some things about this metal, which was really interesting. The plate that was connecting the stump to the leg had a very high zinc content. Um, and technology for um, metals and metal forming um, changed over time. We know that the high zinc content in a leaded brass really does post-date the mid 19th century. Again, later than that 1836 etching. So this goes along with our same theory that these threaded rods must have come in at a later date. Um, so we know we can date the metal because of its contents, but can you date stone? Unfortunately, you cannot. Um, the analysis for stone is a type of analysis called isotopic analysis. Um, it will be able to tell you where on the earth the stone came from. If you were going to date the stone, you would be dating the formation of the stone, which would not help us very much. But if you're able to figure out where on the earth that it came from, you can identify the quarry that it came from. And if the quarry was only open in ancient times, you can assume that this stone was quarried and uh, carved during ancient times. Um, but in order to do that, we had to take samples. And in the world of conservation, we, we do not take samples lightly. Um, this is probably on the bottom of the heel, the only sample spot you'd be able to see in Bacchus today. Every other area we made sure was on a break edge or an area that we were going to be covering up later because we didn't want any of these to show. Um, so the nerve wracking process of taking samples, there's our little hole. Um, we took a, a, a small amount of powder, um, we packaged it up, made sure we weighed it so we knew that there would be enough, and we sent it off to a scientist in Oregon that we work with. Now, the process of isotopic analysis, in, in simple terms, um, it compares the carbon isotopes and the oxygen isotopes within a sample, and those ratio of those two are able to help you decide where on earth uh, it came from. It gives you a Venn diagram like you see here. Um, and so if it has a certain, you have the carbon um, on the left and the oxygen on the bottom. And so that ratio places it on this um, field. And we know because um, the stones around the Mediterranean have been studied so often, um, and there's quite a wonderful database. And so we can compare it to other things that we know where they came from. But if you see in this Venn diagram, like all good Venn diagrams, there's a bunch of overlap. So it's interesting to know that, that the science can give you a number, it can give you a percentage, we think this is 85% um, pentelic marble, um, but you still have to have the scientist who really knows what he's looking for come and analyze it. So this, here we have a picture of Scott Pike. He's our geologist and archeologist um, from Salem, Oregon. And here he was showing us the foliation lines in this hymetic marble, which were indicating to him that this was hymetic marble, also the color, the grain size, um, that sort of thing. So one of the interesting um, sections of, of Bacchus in general is the right leg. Um, we were able to identify, yes, it's pentelic marble. We found these pyrite, which is fool's gold. Um, very, very small on the surface, but they look like little tiny rectangles of dark uh, matter. But for me, what was really important um, is he was able to tell me what this orange staining was. Um, so the right leg and the left arm have this orange tone to it. And um, as a conservator, it was baffling, it was uh, challenging, and it was not coming off. Um, and so Scott just laughed at me. He said, well, you, you're not going to get that off. What it is, is that pentelic marble has mica running through it. Mica has a high content of iron. And so that is iron oxidized inside the stone. And I wasn't going to be able to get it off at all. Um, so I said, sorry, Caroline, his leg will remain orange. Um, but it's part of the story. And it's what differentiates it from the other leg because the other leg is not pentelic marble. So what we found is that all of the big parts of Bacchus um, were all ancient. They came from around the Mediterranean. Um, the head of Bacchus is from the island of Bassos. Uh, the torso is from Turkey, either Athion or Ephesus. Um, his leg that was orange and his arm that was orange are both pentelic marble with that telltale iron oxidation of the mica. 
The other leg, which is a beautiful pure white uh, marble, is from the island of Paros. And then the stump and the base are hymetic marble. And it was really fascinating because the orange tone in the pentelic marble and the Greek gray tone in the hymetic marble is only about 90 miles away. Um, but geographically, uh, geologically, they're, they're totally different. So what this tells us is these are all ancient. Um, and we had a lot more ancient here than we originally thought. Remember when Caroline was talking about the initial uh, research into the piece, we knew the head was ancient, we knew the torso was ancient. We kind of thought the other stuff was just Renaissance um, sculptors adding things in, but you can tell here that is not um, the case at all. All right. So what are we gonna do now? We have all these ancient pieces. We have a plan to separate the torso, but everything else is ancient too. Does it start making sense to really highlight the torso when the rest of it is also ancient? Um, in the gamma rays, one area that was extremely um, worrisome to me was the right leg. Um, I was very concerned that any pushing or pulling or um, force at all on the sculpture was going to cause more damage. There was a lot of joints, a lot of cracks, and a whole lot of metal components within it. Um, so we, we contacted this wonderful engineer named Andy Terrell. He's in Raleigh. Um, and he came in order to try to help us understand the different forces that were at play on the sculpture. Um, he used the scans that we had taken, the 3D light scans, um, and engineering programs in order to determine the center of gravity and for what forces were on each part of the marble. Happily, he found that most of the weight of the sculpture was leaning on his very stable left leg and the stump, and very little was on the right leg. So if we left him just as he was, he would be stable um, and happy and content. Um, but he really felt that this right knee, this one here that you see on the, on the screen, um, would probably collapse and be incredibly damaged and irreplaceable um, if we tried to take the torso off. And so we realized we had to A, listen to the engineer, um, and B, there were really these wonderful trends in conservation um, that we, we started to pay attention to. Um, conservation and restoration is often influenced by cultural and social tastes of the time. Um, and there was a tendency in the middle of the 20th century when Bacchus came in, the 50s, 60s, um, to really strip things down to the pure, to the, the essential ancient pieces to these sculptures. Um, and so you have a picture here on the left of uh, Leda and the Swan from the Getty Museum. Um, in the 60s, every Thing was stripped off it that wasn't ancient. And at the time it was a great idea. Um, but as things went on, you realized you couldn't really tell the story of Leda the Swan so well. It was almost like a stump of a sculpture with cavities and pinholes and different areas that just didn't read well. Um, and so as time went on towards the end of the 20th century in the 1990s and the early 2000s, um, we started really trying to think about the sculpture as a whole. And so the Getty took this out of all of the, the restored pieces they had taken off, they had saved in storage, which is wonderful and everyone should do this forever. They took them back and they put them onto the sculpture again. And what you see in the middle is how laid in the swan sits now. So it has the ancient core, but it has all these other pieces on it that were done really in the Renaissance. Um, and so it's honoring all of the different time periods of this sculpture. Um, and the didactic label, which is shown here on the right, it is clearly identifying where the different pieces come from. So it's the ancient pieces, as well as the historical uh, restorations and a little bit of, of extra things that were done in the 1997 when this treatment happened. Um, but the viewer can understand this. They can look at the picture and see what is ancient. They can see what um, the restorers in the, in the Renaissance were thinking when they wanted to change this. Um, they could also see that the body of the swan is ancient, so it most likely was a Leda in the swan. And we really started thinking about these levels of complexity, these levels of historic importance um, in relation to how they were with Bacchus. So as Caroline told you, um, he was in the Palazzo Temps. He was sold by Canessa to uh, JP Morgan. These are two very big and very important collections of art. And by stripping him down just to his torso, just to his ancient times, we don't really honor that all, the other histories. And, and he has been Bacchus, standing as Bacchus for about three, 400 years now. That's a lot of time and a lot of history um, that we can tell the story of. So, Remember that original plan? Take out the torso, take out the head, and then remake Bacchus. 
um, as he stood in the flots all temps? Well, we decided that wasn't possible. Really, it was the science of the engineering that that was the impetus to change our plan, you know? So, um, but the conservation trends and these sort of things really supported it as well. And so we were very comfortable with this decision when it came about. So we decided that we had to return him to how he looked at the Palazzo temps. So the hands-on treatment, um, this all started um, all along the same time. So we were researching him while we were cleaning him and all of these things. Um, and so these are my favorite erasers. I'd love to tell everyone about them. They're German. It's Mars plastic um, Stedler erasers. Um, they've been tested by scientists and they never leave anything behind, which is what we want for conservation. Um, and then people are either thrilled or horrified uh, to learn that the conservator's favorite way to use these is to combine it with our own spit or saliva. Um, I like to refer to it as personal enzymatic solution. Sounds a lot better that way. Um, but the truth is that the enzymes in your spit um, that help you break down the food also help clean the surface of the sculptures. Um, so you're able to do a really gentle cleaning um, and a controlled cleaning, which is what you want. So areas that um, have less surface on the dirt on the surface are cleaned more gently and areas um, with more significant um, surface grime can be cleaned more intensely. Um, so this was done all over the whole sculpture. Um, and then some stuff just wouldn't come off. And so we're very lucky at the NCMA to have a compact Phoenix laser. This is an ND YAG laser um, by Linton Conservation. And you can see in the picture on the right, so I've cleaned with the laser up to the center point. And then the upper point um, has that gray surface on it that just would not come off with any solvents, no surfactants, any poultices, everything I tried, it just was there. But the laser was a miracle. Um, so this is a, is, a, is a great laser to use. It does very good job cleaning dark dirt off of lighter surfaces. And I will tell you, this is the same crystal um, in the lasers that's used for tattoo removals. So if you think about the dark being cleaned off a lighter surface, it's the same sort of thing. Um, we have another laser for the painting conservators. It's an Erdmium YAG laser. It's a different crystal, so it's a different wavelength. And that is the laser that's used in beauty salons to remove um, beauty marks. So we have it all covered in the conservation lab. Um, and we also did um, all of the leaves and um, berries. Now, the laser can't take away wax, and it also turns the wax slightly an orange color. Um, so anywhere that there was wax still left on the surface, I, was, I used a poultice to get it off. Um, this is a wonderful water-based poultice called agarose gel. It's made from agar, which is a jelly-like substance um, that comes from red algae. And as the red algae becomes more rare, um, it's harder to get agarose. So we are using it sparingly, but this was a perfect, perfect project for it. Um, it removed the orange wax um, immediately. And you can see how the gel on the side, on the right side, after I've pulled it off, has some of that orange color in it. That's the, the wax that was removed from the sculpture. But not everything was successful. I already told you about that orange leg. But then there was also this yellow um, brown tone on the pectoral. Um, and it actually ends up being a calcium oxalate. So Jen Mass, um, who did all of our scientific testing, was able to find that. Now we know that um, in the Renaissance up through the 19th century, um, they used fats, oils, and other materials to apply a gloss on the, on the sculpture. So like waxing your furniture, it looked much better if it was shiny and had an even surface. Um, but unfortunately, these applied materials often darken and yellow over time and they're nearly impossible to remove because they've penetrated into the stone um, and they've also oxidized and so they, they're very very hard to get out. Um, the calcium oxalates specifically that she found are degradation products from waxes and organic materials. Um, they also have uh, chromophores which is why there's this yellow brown tone. So again if you see Bacchus today I invite you all to come. He has a very yellow chest right now but it is also shiny and lovely. Um, so some things could, couldn't entirely be cleaned off. So then we had to start thinking about putting them back together. So um, again, the head had been removed, the leaves and berries had been removed, um, but we wanted to return him to his state of Bacchus. Without his head, he was kind of a lost figure. Um, all of the materials uh, that were used in our conservation treatment to put him back together are all based on this incredible research project um, done by Caroline Riccadelli, who's the object conservator at the Met. Um, so in 2002, I was in grad school at NYU, and one morning our professor just didn't show up, which was very odd. Um, and so we just carried on our day, and it turns out that Tullio Lombardi's atom, um, the mount that he had been standing on, collapsed in the middle of the night for no reason, just on its own. And Adam had fallen on the floor and shattered into many 
many pieces. Um, so much so there was a um, tile floor they went around and took pictures of every tile so they'd be able to put them back together. And what happened after that was a 15 year project to put them back together. And they did an incredible amount of research on the types of adhesives show you the adhesives we end up using. Um, so they used an acrylic resin. So B72 is the object conservator's favorite adhesive. Um, and another um, similar um, acrylic is B48N by combining the two. Um, it has less creep um, over time. It comes in these pellets. We mix it with solvent. So we know exactly what is going into the material. We know that it will be reversible over hundreds of years and it will not yellow over time. Um, so the strength and the appropriateness of this is why um, we ended up selecting that. And pins are a really interesting um, topic. So from the Gamma Ray, you saw that he already has quite a few metal pens in him. Um, it's interesting to look into the historic references on pins. So Italian restorations um, vary. So in Florence, they would use a copper or copper alloy pins, whereas in Rome, they would use uh, more of an iron pin. And here on the right, you see the small um, square profiled pin that I removed from one of the leaves. Um, we cannot use the, the iron any longer because if it gets moist or if it gets moisture in there, the corrosion product expands and it will crack the, the marble. So this is not gonna be something that we'd ever choose to put in. What we end up using now with the Met Found was these five fiberglass reinforced polyester pins, um, which work really well um, and they won't cause damage to the, to the sculpture. And um, they worked with a number of um, scientists actually from Princeton and, and the scientists from Princeton who are far smarter than all the rest of us came to the conclusion that the perfect size pin has a ratio of eight to one, so length to width. And the reason that they said this, it's all based on fracture mechanics. Um, and the idea is that the ideal pin will be long enough um, to create a mechanical connection between the marble. So it's a really joining the marble so that they don't slip, but it's not so long that it causes stress points on either end of, of the pin. So if it was longer, you'd start having these stress points and possible fractures at the end of either of the pins. So this is what we selected to do. So here you have us putting, um, the, the leaves back on the head. Um, it was very obvious where they went because there were these lovely holes um, from the original pins and we reused those so we didn't have to cause any more damage. Um, the entire treatment was done without uh, changing the stone, which was great to see. Um, so we reattached those. We let them sit. Everyone thought he had a headache with a bandage on it and everything, but he was just chilling out for a little while. Um, and this is a during treatment photo with the leaves and berries back on. Um, the fills have not been impainted, so you can see there's a fill on his neck that I haven't gotten to impainting yet. Um, but he had to have all of his leaves and berries put back on before we even thought about putting him onto the body. Now, the join of the head to the body the marble was very close, but the holes going into the head and going into the body were at an angle. So it was not a straight pin that we were gonna be able to use. Um, the pin had to be smaller because we wanted to use one of these straight pins. And I was very, very concerned and everyone was very concerned that this pin was big enough. Um, so we ended up using a potted pin situation. It's where it's adhered into one side and slipped into a sleeve in the, in the lower side. Um, to make the sleeve, you see the picture at the bottom um, where we have bulked adhesive. You put the pin in with a release agent, which was a, a type of soap that we use. After one day of setting, you pull it out and then you let, let it set completely. Um, we put all of these um, pictures and uh, diagrams and mechanics into the engineer's um, computer programs. And he told me, and I quote, based on the weight of the head, Bacchus's geometry, the 516 st structural fiberglass exceeds the required shear capacity of the join approximately to a safety factor of 100. This meant we were good. Um, so I was very glad to have um, the engineer on board so we didn't have to worry about it. All right, so we also had these wonderful 3D models um, made of the head and of the neck so that we could really practice figuring out what direction and what position the head went in. It was much easier to carry a five pound head up there um, rather than the 40 pound, five pound head that was made of marble. And so we really could use these quite a bit um, when discussing appropriate um, positioning with curators and such. And then it was time to put them back on. So um, we carefully positioned it with this gantry 
Um, he took up a lot of room in conservation. Um, the head sling was created by the art handlers. And what they ended up doing was having five points of um, screw mechanisms. So we could do micro adjustments on each side of the head. So once we got him in place, we could then position him exactly where we wanted him um, so he could sit um, while he was uh, adhered. And here he is um, sitting in the lab for three months while the adhesive solvents were evaporating. And again, I love the gantry and I love its connection to that etching I showed you in the very beginning because it is exactly the same mechanisms um, that were used back in the 17 and 1800s. Nothing's changed. Um, so we're doing the same things. Once the, the gantry came down, uh, we had to reattach his mullet. It was a really important fragment um, because it was a triangular form that fit in between the neck and the head. It kept the head from moving forward. Um, and this is just to show you um, the process after we attached all the fragments. So the fills are the areas of white. We impainted them, um, and, or I used a far watercolor. Um, it's just totally reversible. I really love how it mixes and, and you can layer it on. So you can get this layering effect of ancient patina and sculpture uh, marble as well. And so this is the, the, the mullet after um, treatment. And so here are some more um, images of before treatment on the left and after treatment on the right. This is one of the joins um, that had been excavated probably in the 1980s when they were doing the removing the head. They probably tried to see um, if they could remove the torso too. Um, so we filled those and we decided to make a recessed fill. Um, it's really important because we have this whole story of Bacchus being made up of all these different parts um, to be able to show those joins. And in conservation, we have a saying, it's like six inches and, and six feet. So at six inches, you want to be able to see the conservation treatment. You don't want to be disguising it entirely. At six feet, you don't want to be able to see it. You want to be see a uniformed whole um, piece that is aesthetically united. Um, so we went for that. We recessed them very slightly, but we matched the color to the surrounding marble. Here you go as well. And this was Bogus as he came into the museum. Um, now, Caroline was not happy with this state, she wanted to add an arm. And I'll tell you, um, adding large appendages in conservation treatments is not a normal step in contemporary um, art conservation. So I really had to think about it for a while. Um, what really was the convincing factor um, was both this etching from 1836 and then during the treatment, um, Lyle, who's one of our historians, was working on J.P. Morgan's collection and she found this inventory card from the Brummer Gallery. So in 1945, uh, J.P. Morgan's family uh, gave the, a lot of his art to the Brummer Gallery to sell. So 1945 picture, he's got his arm. That's that little black and white picture there in the center. Um, by 1949, when the auction catalog came out, his arm was gone. So we have an etching, historical etching, and a black and white photograph proving that he had an upraised arm with grapes. And this was enough to ethically um, let me go along with this conversation with Caroline. Um, but I said it was okay under a few um, restrictions. One, the marble um, in Bacchus could not be harmed, could not be drilled into, could not be changed, could not be altered even the slightest. Um, uh, it could not be damaged. I wanted to use the L-shaped bracket hole at the back of his shoulder and the pinhole at the end of his arm that would already been in there from when he had this arm that went missing, which we have not been able to find despite our um, attempts. Um, and I wanted it to be completely reversible. Now reversibility is a very important ethical choice in conservation treatments today. Um, but also if anyone came along in the future and decided we were crazy for making an arm, um, I wanted it to be removed immediately. Um, and we were able to achieve this. So this is how we did it. Enter Larry Hayda. Now, Larry is an artist in Hillsboro. He specializes in the human form, but he's also an engineer. So he understood a lot of these problems. Um, I was concerned that the right arm we were going to be adding was over the right leg that was extremely damaged um, and not as secure as the rest of, of the sculpture. So I didn't want any weight added onto it. So carving a new marble arm was completely out of the picture. Um, it had to be lightweight um, and add no stress or strain onto the sculpture. Um, Larry was trying to find a model and so he went to his local gym and he surveyed all of the gentlemen there and I wish I was a fly on the wall, um, but he decided that all of the men at the gym were too bulky, their muscles were too big and they did not fit the stature of Bacchus. And so one night he had an epiphany and he said, 
a basketball player. The statue of Bacchus is six foot eight. Um, so maybe a basketball player with a long lean form would be perfect. So he surveyed all of the local area teams, um, NC State and Duke, and who he found was our darling Wyatt Walker. So Wyatt was uh, a transfer student to NC uh, uh, State basketball. And um, Larry wrote him a letter very kindly asking for his assistance in this project. And he ignored us. Um, and so we said, well, we've got to figure out what's going on. And so we wrote a second letter from um, the director on letterhead from the museum. And it turns out because he was a transfer student, he thought that his teammates were punking him and that this was all a joke. Um, because why in the world would the North Carolina Museum of Art want him to model for an ancient sculpture? But sure enough, we did. Um, and once we got through to him and he understood the, um, the reasoning and his mother told him he absolutely had to, he sat down with us for a half hour at the sports complex um, and we were able to scan his arm because Wyatt is a very busy man. He had classes and basketball and we could only have a half hour. Um, so we hired someone to come and do a 3D scan um, of his arm. And what was great is we had the engineer there, we had the artist, we had Caroline the curator and myself as a conservator. So the engineer could position the arm in a way that the weight would go over the center of the body rather than causing any twist or torque from the body. Um, we didn't want the, the arm to be anywhere in the front. So so that it would pull it down or this sort of thing. So the four of us all agreed. We positioned his arm in this chair that the artist had created um, and he sat there for a half hour for us. So next step, the artist took this information. He joined it onto the 3D scan that we had done of Bacchus himself and he made a little baby Bacchus who still sits on my desk today. He is my favorite part of this entire project. Um, and Caroline uh, uh, agreed that this is the right positioning by looking at the etching and, and the photograph. So once we had approved baby Bacchus, we made another 3D scan of the arm itself to put on the real body. Um, and this was during treatment because you can see Bacchus does not have his head yet. Um, we approved that as well. And so then we were ready to make a mold of this 3D scan in order to cast the arm that would be going on Bacchus. So this is the mold um, that was taken. There is a stainless steel rod running up the middle of the arm. And then there's a fab fiberglass core around it. And the outside is um, coated with a UV stable polyurethane skin. Um, if any of you had seen my talk on um, King Saul and his missing toe, this is the same material we used for that. And we had done a lot of color tests. So we had all kinds of chips to match against Bacchus. And we knew that number 15 was the right color. Um, and so we were able to use that um, to create create the arm here that you see on the side. Once the arm was created, um, Larry came back and used um, some my acrylic paints in order to tone it to match the this, this sculpture itself. And this is the most important part for the whole arm for me. Um, it's not glamorous, it's not a beauty shot, but this is the way that we were able to attach the arm onto the body without any adhesive. There is no adhesive holding this on. It is all mechanically joined um, with this C-clamp that's put in here and it is screwed to the arm itself, the new arm, not the old arm. Um, and it's held there mechanically, which is a wonderful thing. The, the fit was so perfect. Um, there was no area between the new arm and the body itself where for it for to wiggle. Um, and it has moved around quite a few times since then and it is totally stable. Now, what's great about this is I can tell you this is completely reversible. Um, also, we, we want of these joints to be a lot more visible. Um, so the joints around the arm are more significantly um, recessed than the other ones. Uh, when you come to the museum, you look at the sculpture, we don't want our arm to confuse anyone. We don't want someone to come along and say, it's an ancient arm. They must have had this positioning, these grapes. We don't know what they're gonna be studying from the arm, but we want it to be very clear. It is something that we have made. Um, and also it is totally reversible because he is currently in the East Building in the exhibition that I hope you could all come to at some point soon um, if the museum opens again. And in order to get him to the classical court, I'm going to have to remove his arm because he is now too tall to travel through um, our basement corridors. So it will be reversible. I will be reversing it probably in December and then putting it back on when we get over to the, the other classical gallery. And here is Bacchus with his new arm. It really does return his essence of Bacchus. The grapes make him fully identifiable um, and add a lot to the structure. 
So again, this has been a really fantastic project. It's really a once in a lifetime um, situation with all the scientists and researchers and the funding in order to do all of this stuff. Um, so we really wanna thank the Bank of America, IMLS, and especially the wonderful support um, by the Zeises and Don Davis and Peggy Wilkes who have been in to visit multiple times during this treatment um, and have been a real pleasure to work with. So I thank everyone. Um, my email's at the bottom. We're gonna be having a reception now with questions, um, but if you have any important questions you come to your mind afterwards, you're all welcome to email me at any point. So I'm going to stop sharing now. There we go. Thank you, Corey, for you're that welcome. fascinating presentation. Um, so we did get a couple of questions in the chat. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, we did have somebody ask, from which period, it's Addie Stalk. Uh, asked, from which period is the white part of Lita in the swan? Ah, it's ancient, so it's probably um, second or third century. Okay. Yeah, I would think so, something like uh, roughly the same age as Bacchus. Mm -hmm. And then we did get another question. Uh, what metal was the pin connecting Bacchus's head to the torso? Ah, so originally, um, we know because when they removed it, um, the reports say that it was a bent copper alloy pin and it was stuffed in with a number of powder um, sulfur, which was interesting. And um, we don't have that anymore. It was removed in the 80s and it is gone now. But it's fascinating that that's what was used in order to hold it in there. The pin that we use now is a fiberglass um, pin because it was the one that was um, identified by the Met as not going to be disturbing or, or break the sculpture if anything happens in the future. Okay, and we're getting a couple more questions in the chat. Uh, Caroline and Corey, do you keep and preserve the metal pins that you removed? And this is from Scott Feinstein. Absolutely. Um, so in the 80s, um, they didn't. That's okay. Um, we today could be everything. And what was wonderful is so um, they ended up in the bits and bobs box, which had all the leaves and the berries and a couple of the extra pins. I was able to find some copper brackets um, that I ended up putting back into the bottom of the head um, because since they were copper, they were stable enough to use again and they were perfectly fit for the piece. So I'm glad that those remained um, so I could reinstall them. And everything else we keep because we might want to test it later. So uh, there was one leaf that wasn't able to go back on um, because it did not, it fractured when it came off in the eighties. We have that in case we want to be studying that at all afterwards. And we also have Jill Beachler asking if the head was really the head of the Bacchus statue. Nope. So the head comes from the island of Thassos and the body comes from Turkey. So there's no way that that was originally the head that went on the body. And I'll tell you, if you come to the museum, I'm happy to point out his neck is a little long. It doesn't look quite right. Anatomically, he's a little bit off. Um, so it is obvious that this was not the original head that went on the body. Both are ancient, but were originally from different materials. And if I can add, Corey, uh, we've also discovered with our consultant that the original, the torso, the original sculpture it was part of was not a Bacchus. Mm -hmm. Like this is really a Mr. Potato Head where you take fragments um, and create something new. You had an ancient head of a Dionysus, which is the Greek version of Bacchus. You had a really nice and sexy torso. It's like, ooh, put that together, stick a bunch of uh, legs and arms that are carved from ancient marble. But we're not sure exactly when those were uh, carved. We, can, we can't date the other parts. We can only date the ancient part. And that ancient torso was very likely from a statue of a young hunter where he would have the, a, the raised arm not holding grapes, but maybe holding a rabbit like one of the other pictures uh, that I showed you. So the consultant saw this um, when he did his research, he narrowed it down to the possibility of youth uh, represented as a uh, Roman youth represented as hunters. But hey, you have a bunch of fragments and there's a head of a Dionysus and a sexy torso, stick it together and you have a really good looking Bacchus. And it's important to remember that he's identified at Bacchus because of his grapes and the berries in his hair and his wine cup. Without those things, he could be a lot of different characters. All right, um, Scott, you can go ahead and unmute yourself so you can ask the question yourself. 
Oh, like. hi. It is, it's Scott, but it's actually Kara. So um, it's the birthday girl. But, yes. <laughs> when, when he is moved to the classical gallery, will he be part of the permanent exhibition? Absolutely. Okay. Um, okay. Like Caroline likes to say, he you, deserve it. you deserve it for sure. Yeah. So we have him on a base that was created so the base can move around. So we never have to push him anywhere because of that knee is still not that stable. Um, so we can move him to the new place and the new exhibition mount goes around the base. So he's going to always be on that same stable place. And Bacchus has never actually been displayed in a classical ancient context ever at all. Mm -hmm. Ever, ever, ever. That's amazing. Wow. Yeah. So, but oddly enough, you can fit both in an ancient gallery and a neoclassical gallery um, as well, or Renaissance gallery, yeah. Mm -hmm. Does anybody else have any questions? You can unmute yourself. Your fantastic job. Thank you so Thank much. You. Oh, we did get... Did oh. you want to tell them about the publication that's coming out? Sure. I, I, I just, when Corey was finishing her talk, I went and got a glass of <clears throat> Japanese plum wine. And I thought we could probably do a little toast to Bacchus, mm -hmm. uh, to the completion of the conservation treatment, as you've seen, to the completion of the exhibition that nobody can see, <laughs> uh, to the day. completion one of day. the catalog that arrived yesterday and is currently still in boxes and we have yet to see. Um, and this is the second last Bacchus event. So cheers uh, to, cheers. to Bacchus, cheers to us. Cheers to Bacchus. Cheers. Ah. Thank you everyone for joining us. This has been great fun. You know what's great to see about the museum? Mm -hmm. how, how much diversity and inclusion there is in the employment and work you're doing. So it's fantastic. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you. Does anybody else have any questions? I did see a couple more in the chat. Um, somebody wanted to know, Tim and Beth O'Connell, are all the found, were all the found parts the same scale and size? No, <laughs> no. So um, again, all of you are welcome to come and visit me and I would love to point these out to you standing in front of Bacchus. His legs are slightly different um, and his neck is off and his arms a little bit wonky. Um, what's interesting when you look at the black and white photo from the Brummer Gallery, the arm that was removed was in really extended. Um, and the Brummer Gallery in New York City was known to remove things that didn't look quite right. And so we think maybe the arm was just so obviously uh, not ancient and not at all appropriate to it that that's why it actually removed. Everything else was good enough if you don't look closely. <laughs> um, we also have Mary Beth asking, uh, was any of his marble parts from Carrara? Yes, so, so that's what we were really, we were trying to find Carrara. So if it had been pieces that were added in the Renaissance or a little bit later, it would probably have been Italian marble, right? So Carrara is in Italy, it's what would have been selected. It's what was used for um, King Saul that we worked on. Um, but we only found that the, some of the leaves and the patch on the back of his butt. So um, the hand with the cup is inconclusive. So it could be Carrara, it's very close to being Carrara, but it's not so much so that we can say it is. Um, so things that would have been added on when they made him to Bacchus would have been Carrara, but most of it was ancient and we just were not expecting to find that. We were expecting the legs um, and the arms to be Carrara as well. And if you want to know more about all these odd little tidbits of you know, scientific and art histor historical information, the next and last Bacchus event is Bacchus Scholars Day on September 12th. And for the first time ever, all the Bacchus consultants will be in the same virtual room together. Uh, Corey and I have worked with all of them, but all separately. So it'll be the first time we're all um, together, all nine of us, plus the guy who did the 3D scan, David um, Bassett. Um, so I think that's going to be a really fun and interesting, like really nitty gritty, hardcore science and uh, technical art history. But don't um, be scared. It's still going to be wonderful. <laughs> of course, because it's Bacchus and it's us. Yeah. Um, it's been a real pleasure that the people that have worked on this project have just been sensational. And every single consultant has added a new layer of interest and revealed something more about Bacchus. 
We received another question. Um, Francis Castillo wants to know, can you tell where the ancient marble was from? Mm -hmm. Yep, so that's that isotopic analysis. Um, and so uh, in the publication, there's a whole chapter on it, which is great goes into detail about where things come from. So it's the quarry that we can identify. And again, the head is from Thassos, the torso is from Turkey. One leg is from um, the island of Paros and one is from um, Pentelic marble. So they're all different. And we've received a couple of comments. Uh, Luis Torres says, I had no idea art conservation was so cool. Excellent. <laughs> and uh, a lot of people are asking for maybe a virtual tour of the of the Bacchus statue, which would be great. We would love to do that. So the exhibition right now is, is sensational. Um, conservation, although it is close, near and dear to my heart, is not often portrayed as, as essential in exhibitions. And this one really focuses on every step that we were talking about and every researcher that was involved. Um, so at this point, it should be up until December. Um, January, so, January, oh, the end of January. Longer. January, um, it's our favorite exhibition, so I really <laughs> recommend everybody come. Um, but it really just has one artifact, you know, it has it has the Brummer catalog um, that was sold, um, and then the sculpture of, of Bacchus itself, but it's about the whole level of unpacking this history. Uh, and we just received a really interesting question from Charles Berlin. Should we be honoring a sculpture that is actually a sort of composite Frankenstein piece, the same as a sculpture that is entirely the work of a single sculptor? Very interesting. Yeah. Like Caroline, I, I, I would say yes, that. yes. Um, because if you if, go, go to any museum in Italy, and I would say that most of the sculptures have actually been restored at some point in time. Um, they're very, like intact ancient sculptures are more rare than not. Um, I mean, there are some, obviously, um, but what is really fascinating, I mean, the thing is Bacchus represents the history of composite sculptures and restoration practices for like 400 years. Uh, so this is very interesting. Um, and it, it uh, just sort of an aside, just to give you a little bit more information, we wanted to figure out when our Bacchus was put together and we tried to find a person who was specialized in composite sculpture it took about two years to find him. And Corey and I had to be in Italy. I was on a ladder. Corey was holding the ladder. I was taking photos. We're chatting with the curator of the statue, the one with the, the guy holding the rabbit in Rome. And we're like, oh my God, it's so hard to find a person specialized in composite sculptures. And she's like, when you get down, I'll give you a name. And we got this person and he looked at the Bacchus and he's like, this is no way Renaissance, like, it was not put together in the Renaissance. This is neoclassical. And just by looking at it, the, at the style and the science actually confirmed that the joints, the, the, at the hand, for example, and the arm confirms that these are the materials used in the late 18th century, early 19th um, century. Uh, 17th and 18th, sorry. Yeah, the, the Palazzo Temps has a um, family archives that Caroline and I are still trying to get into. It's in the Castle Al Temps, um, but the niece of the Duke has not returned to any of our letters of interest. So stay tuned. We might someday get into the castle where we hope there's more um, paperwork behind Bacchus, but we haven't been let in yet. He has not revealed all his secrets yet. <laughs> hey, Corey. Yes. Hey, it's Scott. How are you? Hello, good to see you. I'm going to give a plug for the archives. How important is the research in, in the provenance from the archives at the North Carolina Museum of Art and other sources in being able to date your material and provide the provenance and give you all the data you need to do all this different analysis? Absolutely. Great. Caroline, do you want to answer that? Plug for Tara. Yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> well, and, and th that's that's really related to the curatorial side of research. That mm -hmm. is the most important thing for us is to do the provenance. Archives, libraries are the source for our uh, research. And I cannot say this enough. And there is a section in the exhibition just on provenance research. Mm -hmm. Just and, and that's why we have the books in that little case that shows this is how you do provenance research. Looking at the statue is not going to tell you where it come from. You have to find this specific drawn work of art in a book to say that is ours. Mm -hmm. And just to give you another, I'm just giving all this stuff away. 
the 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 Palazzo, the Palazzo Altem's archives do state there is a Bacchus that dates uh, in multiple inventory, so at least to 1670, I think, if I remember correctly. But no images. You just like Bacchus holding a bunch of grapes, no pictures, roughly the same size. But if we know that ours was made during the neoclassical period, it means that. Like maybe the cup was changed. It was a, a different looking cup. Maybe the hand was not holding the grapes exactly in the same fashion. Sometimes you see the hand resting on the head. Could it have been that? Who knows? Is it the same Bacchus that you see all the way down to 1670? Without a picture, we cannot tell. And that's why we want to go to the castle all temps. Yeah, and then if when we you, find when an image with that torso. When you look at what you've learned, by this exhibit and this provenance and this ability to date and carbon and all the work you've done, is there a way that you can share your information with other art historians to make it um, more of a community of, of similar interests so that they can learn from what you've done? That is why we published the, the catalog because the catalog is really about all these steps, all the scholars, whatever their very focused um, research area was. Um, that's why we published, just like we learned from the Adam, uh, the Tulio mm -hmm. um, fiasco at the Met, we learned from it from a conservation standpoint. We want people to learn from our project, and that is why we thought it was super important to have a publication um, that other museums and conservators and anybody interested in technical art history and provenance can look at uh, and well, just you know, you know, more art and budgets is what I say. More fun, well, more art and budgets. Well, if you get the invitation to the archives in Italy, I'm happy to go along as a researcher. <laughs> yes, we invite Absolutely. You. We also wanted to take a tour of all the locations the Bacchus came from. So we, we were like, oh, we can go to Athens, all the islands, and Turkey. And, and a quarry tour, all yeah. of them. A so that might be tour. on our future bucket list. Um, we did get another question. Um, Deborah Kramer says, uh, this has been so interesting. I had no idea how these ancient statues had been restored. Is it unusual to find an ancient statue to be found in its entirety? Yes. Um, so a lot of them have restored areas like arms. The arms often break off, the noses break off. It's those appendages. If they're sticking out and they fall over, they will often break. Um, so it's very rare to have an, a complete sculpture. Mm -hmm. Maria, I wish I could hear what you're saying. Oh. I'm sure it's extremely <laughs> interesting. Yeah. Um, doesn't look like we're getting any more questions, but if anybody just wants to say something else, some last. Hi, Natalia. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, we did get a Hi, message from Tiara. Uh, she wants to know, what's your next project? Oh, uh, finishing the classical catalog. <laughs> So because this is Caroline, but Caroline is also the curator of the pre-Columbian collection um, that we have a scholar working on right now. And so um, focusing on that, that's really been overlooked for quite a while. Um, while we have the expertise in house is really where I hope to turn my interests. And uh, we got another question from Francis Castillo. How often were ancient statues repurposed for political or personal reasons? Mm. If you ask Francesco, who's our um, scholar, of Fernando, the, Fern oh, sorry, Fernando, sorry, Francesco, who asked the question, um, he says that they often were changed. So it would go out of style to have a certain hand with elongated fingers. So they would talk off the arm and put another one on. It was it was a stylish thing in order to re revamp it to be what they wanted at the time. So it was much more common than we would think. And in ancient times too, I, I can't speak so much for the classical sculptures, but I know for Egyptian sculptures, pharaohs reuse other pharaoh statues all the time. You scrape your name, their name off with yours and look, it's Ramses, but he looks like Amenhotep III. Um, so it, I, you, you can do all sorts of things uh, with statues. Um, yeah, for political reasons or others. All right, does anybody, let me check. Is Hercules at the NCMA intact? No, 
He's yep. another composite sculpture. <laughs> We're not taking him apart. Good question. <laughs> yeah, no, he has many pieces that are put together. And we also did Gamma Ray on him at the same time that we did Bacchus. So we have some information on that if someone wants to, to learn more about that later. And that was a comment, or that was a question from Jill Beech Beechler. Uh, we have another question from Brian and Nancy. Uh, this is obviously so fascinating. How can you package this to draw the interest of new younger viewers? I'm thinking 3D, online, et cetera. Yeah, part of this um, project turned out a 360 tour of the Conservation Lab, um, which is a virtual reality 360 tour. Um, I'm hoping Maria has the link and she can put it in the chat box. If not, we can send it to you later. Um, but that featured Bacchus in the tour of the conservation lab. And that's kind of how we're reaching out. It's more digital things. Um, Bacchus has one of the first touch screens in the exhibition where we have all this information on it. Unfortunately, then COVID happened and the touch screen uh, cannot be functioning. Um, so we really have reached out through websites as much as we can. Um, trying to get the younger audiences. And we do a lot of virtual tours um, for classes. It's one of the main um, strengths of our education department. And so we've given a couple of those in the Bacchus exhibition. All right, if nobody else has any questions or last comments, I think this concludes our virtual lecture and happy hour. I say we do one last uh, toast to Bacchus. Oh, one more sip. I have one more sip. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers to Bacchus. Cheers to Bacchus, Cheers. everybody. Thank you for joining Thank you, us. everyone, for coming. Cheers. Have to a good night. Good Thank night. you. Thank you.